If you don't mind, grab your Bibles or any electronic device that you have a Bible app on, hold it up high, and repeat after me. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. The Word of God. The Word of God. And, inside, and inside, God tells me, God tells me the, plans the plans He has for my life. He tells me how much He loves me, even when this world tells me that I am not lovable. And I shall be. All that God desires for me to be. Because His Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. This I proclaim. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't mind, turn your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And it says in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says this. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Amen. And I just want you to, uh, you know, if you don't mind uh, spiritually, just put a little, put that verse, that passage on your heart and just pin it there for a moment um, because we're going to talk about um, one of the things that is often quoted, a statement often quoted, often stated um, as scripture. But once again, it's an idiom. It is, um, it is not in the Bible. And it's so popular. And the statement is, God does not give us more than we can handle. How many of you have heard that before? How, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm not going to put you on the spot. You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have stated that and said that? You don't have to. I, I've, I've said that. Uh, early on, I have said that. And, uh, and it sounds like it's in the Bible. Sounds, sounds close to it. Sounds like good, good old doctrine. Sounds like good, good theology. Um, but that is not in the Bible. And, and it's a common misconception. But at the same time, it's accepted as theology, though it is not supported by any biblical text. And so, but here's how it works. I want you to imagine the mother pregnant with a child, comes close to time to deliver that child. And when the child is born, the child is born stillborn. A friend, a relative who is close to this person, and they lean upon each other in their conversation, in their moments of grieving, in their discussion, the friend, the relative says to the grieving mother, just know that God would never put more on you than you can handle. Imagine someone who has lost their job, going through a divorce, just discovered that they have a form of cancer, they are told, listen, you're going to be all right because when God closes a door, he opens a window. And always remember that God loves you and he will never put more on you than you can handle. But here's the problem with that door. You say when God closes a door, there's always a window. But they never tell you that the window is actually attached to the 12th floor. It sounds good, sounds like good doctrine, sounds like good theology, and the purpose and the goal is to make the person feel better, to make them better, to, to give them some hope. And even in this room, there are people with broken hearts, broken homes, and with broken hope. And what people need when they have broken hearts and broken homes and broken hope they don't need a feel-good message. What they need is truth. 
And biblical truth is always attached with love. Now, I didn't say truth from the world because truth from the world hurts. But the Bible says give truth with love and give love with truth. So when someone gives you biblical truth, it's always attached to love. It comes from a loving place. It, it, it comes with the objective of that person being built back up. It has to do with that person understanding that they are loved, even if they are under pressure. And even if this truth feels like a nasty pill, a me nasty medicine going down, the purpose and the goal and the objective of this truth is so that you know that you are loved. Amen. Biblical truth is always attached to love. People don't need feel good, especially when the feel good and re is not biblical. So let's look at it uh, just a little bit. So do you remember, maybe you recall if you ever read through the book of Job and you know about, if you know anything about Job, uh, Job went through many things. Job lost all of his children swiftly. Job lost, and Job was a wealthy man. Job lost all of his money. And all Job was left with, he lost his home, all Job was left with was a wife who kept telling him to curse God and die. He also had some friends that would come along and they would say stuff and say things like, you know, if you wasn't a sinner, you wouldn't be going through this. Now, Job, the Bible stated off saying that he was a righteous, uh, an upright man, a, uh, a blameless man throughout the land where he was. And yet his friends say, you must be going through this because of your sin. Some of them were saying this. Some of them were saying, hey, Job, he will never put more on you than you can bear. He said all these things. But I want you to notice um, one of the things, the way Job responded to them, Job responded in chapter 16, verse 2 with this. Job says, I have heard many things like these. He was talking about the statements that the friends were making. He says, miserable comforters are you all. Oh, I like that. Oh, man, you, you, you all supposed to be encouragers? You're terrible at this. You, you know, and, and sometimes as believers, we, 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 in loving truth, we need to pull others to the side and say, hey, first of all, that's not Bible. You are. No, you don't have to say it like that. Uh, don't, don't say it like that, but show them the truth. But Job rebuked them because their theology was not biblical theology that they were giving him. But so where does this wrongful thinking come from? that God will never give you more than you can handle. Where does it come from? And after great research and all the good things, you can, you, it, it derives from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, so it, this is not one that came from an Aesop fable or uh, a statement from one of the founding, founders of the country. This was a passage taken out of the Bible, misquoted, misstated, and, uh, and it was given, and, and, and over time it became, God will not give you more than you can handle. But the text doesn't say that. If you recall just a moment ago, you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, right? You recall last week that I told you that normally what I do, I preach through a particular uh, passage, um, exegeting through a text, um, and even in topical preaching as we're doing now, it still, still is going to be expository. Uh, that's the, that's the that's the right way to do that. All right. For, and we got in this room. All, I look around all of our life group leaders. Um, they're known for expository teaching uh, and do a solid job. So if you're not in the life group, get in the life group. OK, but I want to tell you this. If you read First Corinthians 10, verse 13. But you don't read it without reading what was said before it or after it, the verse before it and the verse after it, if you don't read the chapter in a whole, and if you don't read the book in a whole, it's easy, once again, to take that verse and run with it and misquote it and misstate it and with good intention. I know we don't mean wrong when we encourage people to do that. I mean, when we say God will never give you more than handle, we don't, listen, we have good intent. 
But we want to be, listen, we want to be lockstep with this word, right? Yeah. So when you look at verse 12 and verse 13, you get a better understanding of what, I mean, verse 12 and verse 14, you get a better understanding of what verse 13 says. And if you have an understanding of what's going on in 1 Corinthians and why Paul, the apostle Paul who wrote this letter, why he wrote it in the first place. And so in verse 12, he says this, therefore, let the one who thinks he stand watch out that he does not fall. And then in verse 13, no temptation has over, overtaken you except something common to mankind and God is faithful. So he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So this particular passage is not saying that God will uh, eliminate all of our life struggles or all of our burdens. What he is saying is that when you and I are under the burden of temptation and in and, and Paul here, Paul, a lot of times here used the word temptation is translated in Greek as trials or testing or temptation. And here, you know that Paul is speaking of our temptation, our lusts and our uh, desires, because Paul is saying to the church of Corinth, which was a place that was filled with religious idolatry, he is telling them to flee from idolatry and sexual immorality. And so Paul was saying, don't be swept away for, from fo following false gods, false doctrine, and do not practice sexual immorality. You are Christians, you are believers, and so don't get carried away from that, even though I know that you are in an environment where the cut, where, where the, uh, where it has a high pressure for these things, idolatry and immorality. And so Paul was talking to them about the context in which they live. And Paul says, don't be tempted by those things and swept away, even though I know you have to deal with those things on a daily basis, just like we do here. Because you can even say to yourself today, if you struggle with sexual, sexual immorality and you were used to going out uh, into places where sexual immorality is encouraged and promoted, even if you stay away from those things, now temptation comes straight to your phone and your computer. Something can pop up. And before you know it, your fingers will take you away. Before you know it, your mind will take you away and your heart will take you away and your feet will follow your mind and your heart. And he was telling the Christians in Corinth, don't get carried away. But he told them this, you're going to face temptation. There's no one in this room, there's no one outside of this room that will not have to deal with and face temptation. But before I tell you a little bit about that, let, let, me, let me just kind of back it up a little bit. When we make statements, the statement that God will not give you more than you can handle, let me tell you why it's, a, it's so dangerous to make that statement. Let me tell you why it's so harmful. One, when we share that, God will never give you more than you can handle. What we're telling people to do is, uh, by believing this myth, is that you can eliminate our need for God. Think about it. Why do we need an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Why do we need an all-knowing, all-powerful God if we can handle it ourselves? If I can take care of it myself, why do I need you? If I came to you and asked you for $10, it must mean that I either A, don't have $10 at all, or that I am $10 short. If I had it already, I wouldn't ask you. If I ask you to hold another end of a table that I was, and I had the other end, if I ask you for help, it must mean that I need some help. Either it's too heavy or it's too awkward to carry. I wouldn't ask you if I didn't need it. When we say we can handle it on our own, what we're saying is, God, I don't need you. I will take the wheel. And I also not only would take the wheel and do the driving, but I also will determine where I would go. I don't need you. When we say to a person that God will never give you more than you can handle, you can handle it. We're also 
It's also insulting to the person that hears it because it implies that they are weak if they can't handle it. It also makes them feel guilty that they can't handle it. It also contradicts examples throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. For instance, the Bible talks about David. David, you go through the book of Psalm, David struggled all the time. In Psalms 38, verse 4 through 8, uh, you can see the heaviness of David's heart. David was under pressure. Now, listen to this. Does this sound like someone who can handle it? He couldn't. Ver, listen, verse 4 says, For my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. He goes on. He says, my wounds grow foul and fester because of my folly. I am bent over and greatly bowed down, for my loins are filled with burning, and there's no soundness in my flesh. He says, I am benumbed and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. There was a man under pressure. Job was a man under pressure. Moses was a man who was under pressure. Moses came to God and said, I, listen, why you want to use me? I, I, I don't have great leadership skills. I can't speak well. My, my, I have a speech impediment. Couldn't handle it. It contradicts scripture. Paul also boasts about his weakness. Uh, it also makes it sound like God is testing us. And yes, God does test us, but I want you to know that every difficulty that you and I have God didn't send it to you. Listen, I want to say something. I want to say something else. He said, God didn't send it to me. He said, Satan did this to me. I rebuke him. And Satan sent back like, dude, I I, I had nothing to do with that. So God didn't send it to you. Satan says, don't give me credit for that. Well, where did it come from? Some of the tests that we have in our life, trials we have in our life, we made them. Now, we were laughing about that broke man earlier that didn't have a job, wasn't going to look for a job and whatnot. But some people have insisted on marrying that broke man whose philosophy is, I will not work. It's one thing to be out of work and looking for a job. It's another thing to say, I don't want to work. And if you insist on being with that man and you get with that man and, and now you talk about all the trials and the struggles you have, God didn't give that to you. Don't put that on him. Don't, and don't say Satanist. That's you. you. You chose that. That's what you chose. Okay. Uh, that, that was your decision. And everyone has choices, but you get to make the decision. You made that decision, and with all decisions come consequences. But don't, give, don't put that on God, and don't even, listen, don't even say, well, Satan, no, that's you. Man, y'all so quiet. Y'all so quiet. That's, that's, that, 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 that's, that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. Listen. It, it also contradicts many, many Verses in the Bible. I'm just going to give you a few examples. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says this. Now, now once again, I'm going to say the handle. God will never give you more than you can handle. Or God doesn't give you more than you can handle. But watch this. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It doesn't sound like someone who can handle it, right? But look. That's, that's in the New Testament. I take it to the Old Testament. Psalms 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Doesn't sound like someone who's handling it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will gladly boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Sounds like someone who wasn't strong enough on their own. Is that what it sounds like to you? And so, what makes this so unbiblical? James chapter 1, verse 17. What makes this statement so unbiblical? It's an unbiblical statement. It's not only not in the Bible, it is unbiblical. I showed you how, you can see, listen, I can, I can show you probably at least 60 other passages that contradicts this philosophy, this train of thinking that we have uh, bought into, that God will never give us more than we can handle. But James chapter 1, verse 17, um, when it talks about this particular 
uh, uh, philosophy that we have bought into and why it's unbiblical. And one of the things that makes it unbiblical is the fact that it makes it sound like God is the one who is uh, guilty or, or who actually implicates or who administers this tragedy of trials uh, and pressure upon our life. But James chapter one, verse 17 says this. It says, every good thing given. I'm going to slow it down. Think about this. Every good thing given. And every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. So every good and perfect gift that you enjoy, it comes from God, as long as it's not sin. Because God does not sin. And I don't know about you, I don't, I don't ask for trials and struggles on my own. It's never been on my list to say, God, I want you to test me by sending me trials and struggles. I don't have a, a, a bucket list or a wish list or a Christmas list that says I want to go through this. Uh, Lord, if you, if, if you don't, don't mind, uh, take, take, take my transportation away from me. Take a loved one away from me. Strike me down with some type of sickness. Lord, you know what? Take any and all friendships away from me. Lord, if you don't mind, j just, you know what? When I wake up in the morning, let me wake up to an empty house where someone done broke into the house and take everything and just left me laying down the bed. Lord, Lord, so I don't ask for trials. I don't ask for struggles. I don't ask for it. Not if I'm in my right mind. So when I do create trials and struggles that are contrary to the word of God, that must mean that I'm not in perfect alignment with God's will at that time when I create. For instance, when I, and you all heard me talk about it, when I bought a vehicle once and the Lord didn't lay it, listen, the Lord didn't tell me to buy that vehicle. Uh, we bought that vehicle and who suffered for six years, six years on a five year payment. Now you notice, it, I said six years, because I couldn't pay it on time, so I had to keep calling back him. Pushing it back, and you pushing it back, you know, extending the five years to six years, and we struggled the whole time. And we, when we first got that vehicle, it took a month and a half to pay the first note because the note didn't come in for a month and a half. We riding around, and, and we got this vehicle, and the car it was a new minivan. It smelled new. New car smell. And we rode it around, and I'm telling you, a month and a half, we got the note, the first time we got to pay it, that same day, the new car smell disappeared. Y'all think I'm kidding. It disappeared. First payment I got, I like the smell. The smell is gone. It's gone. Like BB like King, the thrill is gone. It's gone, okay? And then six years, we paid for that car. And literally down the road from the church, used to be a Target or something down the road, that van broke down on the month after we paid it off. The engine on everything just went out. God didn't tell me to do that. He didn't tell me to buy that vehicle in the first place. I knew I shouldn't have bought it when, I, when we got it. I had to borrow some money to put down. On, listen, if you have to borrow some money to put on the down payment, you're probably going to struggle. My, 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 my point is, that was a trial, a test. God didn't create that for me. Satan, Satan didn't create that for me. I had a desire in my heart, and Satan was enjoying it because he was watching me struggle and missing out on what I ought to be doing, he enjoyed, he enjoyed the ride, so to speak, in that minivan. But he did, he, listen, that wasn't him, that was me. That was all me, that's all Joe, all right? So, so, so I'm just saying, that, listen, I just wanna make that point. Don't walk out of here today saying, God put all this on me. Some of the things you got going on in your life that are weighing you down, some of those, you gotta give credit where credit is due. All right, listen, I'm about done with this one. It's, it's, it's wrongful thinking, um, but I, I do want to point this ma major thing out to you, and that's understanding this 1 Corinthians 13. I mean, 10, 10 verse 13. So notice, notice this. this. This passage, once again, is a passage that deals with a person being under temptation. And that's why it starts off saying, let the one who think he stand watch out that he does not fall. In other words, when you scan the room. It's easy to scan the room and hold your head up and no situations going on. Like, I know that person there, 
they struggling in their, 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 their relationship. I know that person there. I know what they did before. They can't get it together. I know that person over there. They're struggling with uh, substance abuse. I know that person over there. Listen, that marriage is not working. And it's easy to look, out, look at the room and point fingers. But he says, be careful as you stand because you may not know it, but you got one foot in the grave and the other foot on the banana peel, so to speak. And he says, as you scan the room, be careful lest you fall as a temptation comes to you. Because what's common to everyone in this room is that we all are tempted by something or some things. No one, no one in this room is immune to temptation. There may be someone in here who is tempted to buy, to spend, to shop uh, for clothes all the time outside of their budget. There may, be some, there may be someone here who is tempted by some type of drug. That, listen, that's not, that's not a temptation for me. I, I've said it before. You can feel me? You can put me in a room filled with crack, cocaine, opium, all kinds of drugs and whatnot. You can come back the next day. It's all going to be there. I'm not going to bother you. Can leave me, listen, you can leave me there for a year. I don't want it. I don't want it. But guess what? Don't do that with red velvet cake. I haven't been around it in a while. You can't put me in the room. Now, you can put five cakes in there. When you come back, a few slices will be missing. Even if I tell you I didn't do it, just look at the icing around my mouth, okay? We all got different things that are going to pull at us. Some things are going to be on the scale of a red velvet cake, and then there's going to be major things. I have minor things, and I have major things that tempt me. Don't think all of yours are minors, because temptations come in a variety of scales and shapes, okay? And it's not just one. We all have temptation. Some of us have the temptation to be right all the time, even when we know we're wrong. I, I, I like that. <laughs> but think about it. We all have temptation. No, no, ma no matter what it is, do you realize some of the arguments that you may have with the person? They will go away if you just go away. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. I, I'm just saying. So, so we all have temptation. But Paul is saying, listen, be, be careful because you don't want to fall. And he says, no temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And that's Paul's way of saying, hey, it is not unusual. It's not abnormal for you to be tempted. It's not abnormal for you as a Christian to be tempted. Temptation is not a sin. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. Temptation in itself is not a sin. Listen, that drug calling you, that boyfriend or that girlfriend trying to get you to sleep with them or that person trying to get you to sleep with them, them trying to appeal to you, that in itself is not a sin. Red velvet cake calling, not a sin. But you over in the bed with this person that you're not married to, that is a sin. Something in the store that you have not paid for. It may be calling you. That may used to be your background. That call to you, that appeal to you in itself is not a sin. But when you go and surrender to it, it becomes a sin. Someone upsetting you at the store or the restaurant. Listen, I was with a, a, a group of students recently and there was a lot of people in this place where we were at and there was another group far off to the side and there was one or two people in that group that was acting really ugly and that it was, it, it was I was embarrassed for the person. And, and they were just nasty with their words, nasty with their body language and whatnot. And I saw what triggered it. And it was not the person's fault, but it was the person who was going off, it was completely them. But let me tell you this, even if it was someone's fault, if someone's rude to you at the store, if someone's rude to you at school, if someone says something to you that you consider out, out uh, that, that's inappropriate or not right, or they spoke to you in a nasty tone and whatnot, that's them. When you match them, 
You can't complain about them anymore. You, you just match them. And I know, I know human nature is I got to get back at them. And when I get back at you, I don't like to be even. I like to win. So you take it up another notch. That temptation to be right and that temptation to win when all you had to do was walk away because guess what? It doesn't change one aspect of your life if you had just walked away. Sometimes you can just say, I'm sorry you took it the wrong way. If you didn't do anything wrong, say, listen, I'm sorry if I upset you and you can go on about your business. You don't have to stay there, but you try to match it. So some temptations have to do with our words. Some have to do with our action. But when, when you give in to it, you, you, you sin now. And Paul's saying, listen, be careful. And it's not uncommon for any person in this room to be tempted. I don't care about your age, what you're going through. And listen, no matter how much Bible you know, no matter how much you pray, no matter how close you walk with the Lord, you will still be faced with temptation while you're on this earth. There's always someone or something calling. You, you with me? All right. So, and then Paul says uh, after that, but God is faithful, so he will not allow you, that same verse, verse 13, to be tempted beyond what you are able. So what, what the Bible is saying here is that when you are being tempted, that God always provides an exit. This is not about life struggles. He's, he's, listen, this is about temptation. This verse here has been misconstrued. This verse is talking specifically about temptation. When you're under temptation, the Bible says that he will allow you a way out. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also. There's always a hatchet, always a release door, an exit door when you're being tempted. When someone tries to get you to do something that is sexually immoral, when someone tries to get you to do something that is unethical, there's always a way out. Always a way out. You don't have to yield to it. So God always provides a way of escape. That's what the text is saying, so that you will be able to endure it. In other words, he's going to provide you a way out so that you can get out. Now, you say, well, well why am I still under it? Because you didn't get out. I mean, really. I've given you a door to get out. I've given you a way out. If there's someone in your life that's trying to tempt you to do something that is wrong, unethical, immoral, whatever it may be, you have A, you can say, I'm not going to do that. You can say, hey, listen, I love you. I'll continue to pray for you and whatnot. I can't even be in situations with you because you may get yourself into something and attach it to me. Listen, there's some friends I used to have back in the days if they asked me for a ride, I wouldn't even give them a ride in my car. Now, I know some of y'all say, hold on, that, you won't give a man a ride? I said what I said. <laughs> won't get a ride with me. Let me tell you why. You won't ride with me because your philosophy in life hasn't changed. If you're one of those people that believes that when you walk in the store, you are entitled to free things. <laughs> you can't hop in my car when you walk out the bank and say, I need a ride home. Now, you may have went in there and you probably were honest and cash your check. But because you have a philosophy of life that you have expressed to me, you can't get in my car because you may have received something and they might think I'm your driver. Got to use some wisdom. If you know someone is trying to get you to fall into sin or if you find yourself being pulled to call by sin, if you struggle with pornography, God says, I give you a way out for that too. I, I give you a way out. If you struggle with pornography, you got several options. Do you know that there are programs, free programs, that you can have a buddy that when you go to an explicit site, it will alert your buddy, your accountability partner. Now, don't get an accountability partner that's struggling with the same thing you're struggling with. <laughs> you know? Because they're going to be like, well, what site you on? You know, don't do that. Uh, don't, don't, don't do that. You know, so oh, don't ask that. Get you an accountability partner. So, if, it, so, so if, if, if that was a struggle of mine, I would make JC my accountability partner. It would alert him. And JC's going to call me or come to my house and say, hey, what's going on? 
The whole world doesn't know, but he will hold me accountable. There's free programs out there for that. Two, guess what you can do? You can always, work, you know how the Bible says, if your right hand offend thee, cut it off. If that computer offend thee, get rid of it. Your phone, you can set your phone up where certain things don't work at certain times. You can also do your kids' phone like that. It's all kinds of things you can do. To whom much is given, much is required. You gotta use, listen, you, you, listen. Here's the deal. There's always an exit plan. There's always a way out. There's always a way out. If, if you're with a group of people, young people, if you're with a group of people and uh, the crowd is uh, bullies, there's a way out. You don't have to be a bully too. My point is, for no matter what the temptation is, there's a way out. You know, sometimes the best thing you can do, uh, even certain debates and arguments, and JC, you mind for a second? I'm by. Sometimes, sometimes the best thing to do if two people are not seeing eye to eye, especially Christian brothers. They don't see eye to eye, they're upset, and they start to talk, and the tone of the conversation changes. And it's different, ladies, don't, no, no offense, it's different for men than it is for ladies, an argument, okay? And men, they, they're gonna, they usually say what they're going to say, and the next day, they can move on. <laughs> it's Father's Day. Be nice to me. <laughs> All right. Listen, listen. But ladies, they're going to they remind you that you offended me. And what, what year is this, 2024? You offended me in 1987. <laughs> Like, man, that was just a few years after E.T. came out. Let it go. Uh, but but, but men, men, when we notice, like, the tone level is changing and whatnot, men, they argue, but it's a different type of argument because it's just the way they built. But he'll notice a tone in my voice. I'll notice a tone in his voice, and I recognize his, it's at a stress level. And he recognized mine is at a stress level. Well, we got some choices here. We can physically fight, far extreme, wrong, sinful, right? No one wants to do that. Two, we can sit here and continue to argue, and we can't see through our pride right now. Or he could say, listen, I love you, brother. And he'd be like, I love you, too. I honor you, brother. Well, I honor you, too. And you know I respect you. And I know you respect me, too. Let's, let's talk about this uh, another time. We can easily do that, right? That's right. Because part of my job, part of his job is to help hold me up, right? And part of my job is to help hold him up. We're not going to see eye to eye and agree on every single thing. But what we, he and I can always agree on is what God has finally said, right? But some areas in life we're going to find, and it says it's a little gray here, but we got to have enough respect and love for each other where we're not tempted by our pride to be right. If you are married or you're about to be married, there's going to be many times you need to just, listen, just let it go. That, that, I didn't say sweep it under the rug. Just let it go by giving it to God. And sometimes you can say, hey, I don't know what I did wrong in this. Could you point that out to me? I don't know what you did wrong. Well, I'm sorry if I offended you. You can pick up another time to pick it up. JC, stay here. Don't, don't go anywhere because I, 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 got, I got a point. Okay. I want, I, want, I want to close with this right here. So God provides a way out. And, and as I shared with you in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that passage specifically is about temptation. And I want you to remember this too. The scope of trials in your life, they're going to continue to grow, Right? at different times, and sometimes they're going to be small. And if there's someone in this room that's not going through something, they are about to go through something, or they just came out, because everyone goes through trials. God will help you in whatever you're going through, but he's not putting all the weight on you. 
JC, I love you. I'm going to ask you to do something. Okay. But I don't want you to do it by yourself. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, I want you to stand right here, if you okay. don't mind, for just a moment. Okay. Just there. Hey, Ray, you mind helping me for a second? You got to help me. You got to help me. <laughs> just, just help me. You just, you, just, you just stand there for a moment. I, 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 need, your, I need your help. So, In life, we all gonna face various trials. Everyone knows that, right? And we all gonna face struggles and we're all gonna be burdened at different times. The problem is, if you believe that philosophy that God never gives you more than you can handle, you're gonna be trying to do everything in your own strength. And you're gonna fail and you're gonna fail miserably. God, listen, here's what God has promised. God has promised his presence. He has promised his presence. And God has promised his power. God has promised his presence and his power. God says, I will always be with you. That's one of the things I love about Deuteronomy 31. Wherever you go, I'm with you. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He's always with us. God will show his presence. He's always with you. So no matter what you're going through, so you, whatever trial, struggle you're going through, God is with you. I just need you to stand right here now. All right? And so I want you to imagine God is with you, okay? But God says I can do this too. When you're under pressure, you're under pressure, and you're trying to deal with it on your own, and imagine me as that pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did y'all see that? Listen, I, I promise you this. I promise you this. I didn't talk to him. I ain't talked to him. He knew exactly what to do. Don't get in front of him. Get behind him because this is, listen. This is, this is different because I got to get through him. And then here's the thing. No matter where he goes, he has him with him. Wherever he goes. JC, let me just show you something. This is wrong. This, this is wrong. He, he trying to handle everything that comes his way and, and, and don't walk away from here saying that the preacher said every struggle in my life I create. There are some trials and struggles that God sends you. And those trials and, and testing that God sends you, they're designed to shape and mold you and make you strong. And then there are trials and struggles that, and, and, and stuff that we create. And God blesses our mess. <laughs> He, he, he reaches in, stuff we created, and he comes to the rescue. But there is nowhere in the Bible where it says, JC, you handle all of the problems. It's all on you. No, get back in your proper place and let the weight be on him. Let, let the weight be on him. Man, man, thank you. Y'all head them down. Pat, listen. So, I'm just going to close by reading this verse. I thought this was a, like a really powerful passage to close with. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. I am with you. I'm present. It says, do not anxiously look about you. When you're going through your struggles, your problems, don't look around and fret and say, uh, uh, what am I going to do? Who do I turn to? Remember, he's with you. He says, watch this, for I am your God. So one, he says, I'm with you. I'm present. Two, I also give you my person. I am your God. But then watch, he says, watch what he says about his power. He says, I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. As uh, prayer partners, friends, uh, 
come to the front. I recall the story that I shared with you all once, and that story has always impacted my life of a father and his son walking through the woods. And the son, he was just a few feet in front of the father, but he, his feet moved a little faster than the dad's because his legs weren't as long as his dad. And there was this big old rock in the pathway. And the rock was about this high. And the son, son said, Dad, do you believe I can move that rock? Do you believe I can? Do you believe, Lord, F Father, if I use all my strength, can I move that rock? His dad says, yeah, you can. So the son started to push the rock but that rock didn't move. And the boy, he put his feet deep into the dirt and he pushed, he was grunting, but the rock didn't move. The boy turned around and he pushed with his leg strength, with his back against the rock, but that rock didn't move at all. The boy even stepped back several feet and he ran and he bumped into the rock. The rock then bulged a bit. And the boy continued to do this over and over, trying everything that he could, but that rock would not move. And eventually he wore himself out and he started to cry. He said, Dad, you said if I use all my strength, you said that I could move that rock. You said that rock would move if I used all my strength. His dad said, I did tell you that. And his son said, but it has not moved. And the father said, it's because you haven't used all your strength. And the boy said, yes, I did. I did everything I could. Your dad said, the dad said, but you didn't use me. See, sometimes your strength, what you need, he's right there. So what you can't handle, you're only going through because you haven't turned it over to him. And you need to turn it over to him. What if you turned your marriage over to him? Even if your spouse doesn't want to turn it off, you turn your part over to him. What if you turn your kids that you may be struggling with? And, and if not, you know, kids become teenagers. Sometimes they don't listen. Sometimes, listen. But even if they act right all the time, why don't you turn them over to him? What about your finances? What if you stop utilizing your finances to serve you? but say, God, I give you control and charge of my finances. And you do what you want to do with it. You show me where to save. You show me where to invest. You show me, Lord, what to do with your gift that you have given me. What about your sickness? I know you're going to the doctor. I know you probably tried every medicine, every surgery, everything you can, but have you turned it over to him? Doesn't mean you stop going to the doctor. Doesn't mean you stop working. Doesn't mean you stop parenting. But what if you turned it over to him and your growth in Christ. Why don't you say, Lord, I surrender to you. When you turn it over to him, you're going to realize that you have more strength than you know. And your strength actually lies and rests in him. And don't think you are alone with this because I saved one person when I was naming people from the Bible who had struggles. Moses, Paul, David. I didn't tell you about Abraham, Job, but that was one in particular I didn't tell you about to now. Even Jesus. He was in the garden. And he recognized the cup that he would have to drink from. He called upon the Father because he needed the Father's strength. He needed the Father's strength. And so don't think to yourself that you can handle it because if Jesus calls upon the Father, if the Son of God calls upon God the Father, don't you think you and I should?